So we're going to, uh, I, I mentioned John 17. We'll kind of start there. We will end up landing in Zechariah 3. We might hit a couple spots before that, but we'll land in Zechariah 3 and a few other places. But we'll start in John chapter 17. I'm going to read verse 22. So again, this is Jesus praying to the Father, and I want you to notice twice he's going to say this in just two verses here. So he says in verse 22, it says, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. Speaking of his disciples, but then he actually says in the same passage, I'm not talking about these only, I'm talking about Everybody who's going to believe through my name. So this is for you too. So he says, the glory that you have given me, I've given to them that they may be one even as we are one. Who's the we there? Father and the Son, right? So so we're talking about the (laughs) relationship between the Father and Son. Remember the... You've got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, three persons, same essence. Is there any break in that unity? Can you can you really like I mean, I know there's there's distinctions, but can you really separate them out? Like, well, here's where the Father ends and here's where the Son begins. Jesus prays for the same unity between him and the Father, and he wants it between us. Between us and him, that's the vertical, but then horizontally between one another. I mean, this is something that it's like, how, does, how is that even possible? <laughs> but Jesus prayed it, so it must be true, right? Do you think that Jesus prayed a prayer that will not be answered? When Jesus prays, is it the perfect will of the Father? So it will be answered. So this is where things are going, right? Whether it looks like it in the natural or not, this is where we're headed. Perfect unity. This is the next phrase. So he says uh, in verse 23, I in them, Jesus in us, and you, you the Father, in me, that they, that's all of us, we keep track of all the... (laughs) the pronouns here, (laughs) that they, you and I, may be perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, that's that's you and I, even as you love me. So the same way that the Father loves the Son, he loves you and I. Same love. So that's twice there in just two verses, Jesus prays that we would be one perfectly, the same way that he and the Father are one. Jesus actually prays this prayer about us being one as he and the Father are one, and he uses different, different language four times in John 17. Four times. We having some trouble in paradise back there? <laughs> That's all right. So four times he prays that. I think he's serious about it. And this is where everything's headed. So if that's the destiny for, for the church, if that's the destiny, thank you. Yeah, I can hear myself good. If that's the destiny for you and I, there, there's a road to get there, obviously. But, but listen to this. This is Jesus. These are also red letters, words that Jesus said. Matthew 24. And, and you can turn there if you want, but I'm just going to read one, one or two little phrases here. So he says, uh, this, this is Jesus' discourse on the Mount of Olives, talking about the, the signs of the times before his return. He says, uh, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Verse 10, he says, and many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. 
And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. So we have two pictures of what's to come. And on the one hand, you have Jesus' prayer to the Father, a prayer that no doubt will be answered, that we will be perfectly one as he and the Father are one. The supernatural unity that, again, if Jesus didn't pray, I don't, I don't know if we could have faith for it. <laughs> but he prayed it, so you can take it to the bank. But then in the same context, he says, as we get closer to, to my return, there's going to be a great falling away, and there's going to be a culture of betrayal even within the church. It says many will fall away and betray one another. Now, uh, betrayal isn't uh, something that that guy over there does that you, you, you don't know. Betrayal is a friend that becomes an enemy. You following me? It's an it's a internal family thing. You can't betray someone that you don't have any type of closeness, affiliation, any relationship with. There, there has to be some level of trust there for there to truly be a betrayal. So in the midst of a culture of betrayal, God says, I'm going to bring forth John 17, perfect unity with one another. And I want to say this. I feel like as a community, the Lord has put s some additional grace upon us. And I'm feeling some of that unity growing and fostering. I think some of you might be feeling it too. Um, is that the Lord is giving grace for this. That we would begin to see one another the way that he sees us. And look at each other through that lens. And, and really look at ourselves through that lens. Right? And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. So this, this dynamic is all going to come together before Jesus returns. You're going to have a great falling away. There's going to be great betrayal. But you're going to have a bride who's purged and refined in fire. She'll be beautiful and glorious. And she will be perfectly one. One with the Father and the Son and the Spirit. But one with one another as well. So that's going to come forth at the end of the age. So this is where things are headed. So we might as well get with the program and, and get on the track right now, you know. <laughs> so uh, we're going to look at Zechariah 3 here. So I'm going to read uh, the better part of Zechariah 3. Um, could somebody grab me the, there's a board in the back, and there's, um, <laughs> there, so there's a stand, there's a board, and there's a, a black and a red marker there just sitting on one of the shelves. I'll just take one of those. I should have grabbed that before. Thank you, guys. So uh, Zechariah chapter 3, and uh, Zechariah opens up with he has... Eight visions, and the way they're, they're given to us is like he got these eight visions like all in one night. <laughs> so it was a pretty good night for the prophet uh, in, in, in a sense. You know, it's like I've been having a lot more dreams lately, uh, which is really cool. And uh, I don't know if it's I've gotten around some of you folks and you're talking and sharing your dreams with me. and Because I could probably, before that, I could probably count on one hand, maybe two, uh, the number of dreams that I had and actually, like, really remembered that stuck with me. Like, that was a God dream, and uh, I, I still remember it. But probably in the last several weeks, I've had another three or four at least. And so, like, it's really kind of picked up. But, like, this, Zechariah has eight in one night. <laughs> so he has these, these dreams, these visionary experiences. And uh, so you can read about those in those opening chapters of Zechariah. But people who have studied this out, um, scholars have noticed uh, there's a correlation uh, between these dreams. So, so you got eight dreams or visions. So one, two, three, four, five. Let's try not to run out of room here. Six, seven, eight, okay? 
And they've noticed that the first one and the last one seem to correspond to each other. And so they, they see there's this kind of corresponding between the first and the eighth, uh, the second, the seventh, the third, and the sixth. And so what that means is these ones are also connected. This is the third and the fourth, which is consequently Zechariah 3 and 4. And so there's a, there's a relationship between these. So when I say Zechariah 3, we ought to, in our mind, be thinking Zechariah 4 as well because they're related. And really, all of the visions, <laughs> this probably looks like just, what is this? <laughs> One, two, three. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. It's number four and five. Six, seven, eight, which is, this is Zechariah 3. Here's Zechariah 4. Um, so, when I say Zechariah 3, we, we think of Zechariah 4 as well. It's one flow, and they're, they're meant to be connected. And because they're right in the middle, and there's this kind of symmetry, it kind of draws our attention to the middle, that these two right here, these are the key words. These are the key visions uh, that, that are needed. And is, anybody remember what's going on in Zechariah 4? It's the, the vision of the two olive trees, and you've got the, the bowl uh, that's filling up with this oil, and that's feeding into the lampstand, this seven-lamped uh, menorah. And uh, the Lord's like, what, do you know what this means? He's like, no, I don't. <laughs> he said, it's the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, we know the verse, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So the oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And uh, th the vision goes on from there as an encouragement to the leadership of that day. Specifically, you've got Zerubbabel, who would have been the rightful king, but because they're under foreign rule, he's got to be the governor. So you've got Zerubbabel on the one hand side. So he's line of David. This, this guy would be king if only Persia would let him, right? Uh, so here's the, the king, and here's the high priest, Joshua. And it's a word of encouragement to them, even with all the pressure and the difficulty and the opposition that you face, this work of rebuilding the temple, which the temple is a symbol of, it's God's presence, it's his house, it's a symbol of the Garden of Eden, and I won't develop that, but just look into that if, if that's new to you. And it's a symbol of God's throne on the earth, right? So it's, it's developing that place of the presence, of relationship, of intimacy with the Lord, and it's a, the seat of government from which the kingdom flows out of. That's the temple. And he says, you will complete this work. Not by, not by your money, <laughs> not by your military strength, not by your own abilities and great ideas. I'll use some of those, uh, but it's going to be by my spirit. It's going to be a work of my spirit. But they couldn't do the Zechariah 4 right here without dealing with something here in Zechariah 3. So we're going to look at this here. And here you see... I'm going to read it for you. Zechariah 3, starting in verse 1. It says, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And Yahweh, the Lord, said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who's chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand Plucked from the fire. Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, or see, I've taken your iniquity away from you. And I will clothe you with pure vestments or rich robes. And I said, <laughs> this is actually, Zechariah gets to jump in the vision here. <laughs> he 
He says, I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. He's like, don't forget, don't forget the crown. That's the turban has a little, like a diadem on it. It's, it's, it's kind of a picture of a crown. Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of Yahweh was standing by. And the angel of Yahweh solemnly assured Joshua, thus says the Lord of hosts, the, the God who commands heaven's armies. So when you see Lord of hosts, that's, that's, the, that's the image there. If you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Hear now, O Joshua, high priest, you and your friends, your buddies, your, the guys who are other priests, administrators, people part of your team, right? You and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are a sign. And then he goes on from there. I won't continue um, to read the passage. There's only a few more verses, so if you want to read the rest later, go for it. But the image we have here is Joshua, the high priest, standing before the Lord, and Satan, the enemy, is there to accuse him. Now, it's interesting, if you look at Revelation chapter 12, one of the titles that Satan gets, again, is the accuser of the brethren. Now, you can read about it in Revelation 12, verse 7, it says, a war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, the dragon and his angels fighting back. He's defeated. There's no longer any place found for him. The dragon is thrown down. That ancient serpent who's called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he's thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven, this is verse 10, saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they've conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. So the end time scenario is we overcome. We conquer the accuser. And it's interesting, he's not called here the, the murderer of the brothers. He's called the accuser. One of Satan's primary strategies to hinder the work of God in our lives, the assignment that you have before you, right? We all have an assignment. You have an identity. That's actually, actually different <laughs> than your assignment. Sometimes we get those switched up, and then when it seems like our assignment is not going well, we get all wobbly in our identity and we're not quite sure <laughs> who we are and what's going on. Those are different things. You're a human being, not a human doing. <laughs> the doing is your assignment, right? So whether the assignment seems to be going well or not so well, your identity is secure in Christ, right? Does that make sense? But one of the primary ways that the enemy tries to stall and to hinder that work of God in our lives, fulfilling our assignment, is through accusation. And the accusation is actually twofold. There's accusation against you from the enemy. And if you notice here in the vision, there was, there was some truth to the accusation. Joshua was clothed in dirty, filthy garments, right? But the enemy always takes that little bit of truth and he exaggerates it. <laughs> And he wants to make us feel dirty and accused and defiled and under condemnation, right? But Romans 8 says, for those who are in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation, right? And so what we want to live from is God's view of us, God's lens, God's story over our lives, right? Which his story, his his narrative over your life is his view of you through the lens of his mercy and his grace, but it's also the big picture story of your whole life, right? You might be in a, like a, a valley moment right now, and that's all you see, 
and the enemy likes to come in in those moments and bring accusation, and God's like, I see that's, that might be where you are, but I'm looking at the big picture. Not even just the, the 70 or 80 years of this life. He's like, I'm looking at the millions and billions of years. You're going to be with me forever. We're going to partner together forever. I knew you before the foundation of the world, and I see where I'm taking you. So I'm looking at you through the lens of my story. So it's, it's how we look at ourselves, but it's also how we look at one another, right? And many times... When we receive the voice of accusation in, in our own life, it becomes really easy that, to then give voice to that accusation over other people, right? So it's twofold. It's how do, I, how do we see ourselves? Are we listening to the voice of the accuser? Or are we listening to God's story over our lives? And how do we see one another? Am I looking at you through the lens of your deficiencies, uh, your quirks <laughs> that I don't get, um, you, where you're lacking, where you're weak? Am I looking at you through that lens? And those things might be true, but is it God's story over your life? That weakness, that deficiency, that might be only like one or two percent of the truth. And we say, I just want to, I just want to be real. I just want to tell the truth. And it's like, well, if you're going to tell the truth, you should probably focus on the other 90%, 98% more than you're focusing on that 1% or 2% that irks you about that person because God has a bigger storyline over that person that's way bigger than that 1% or 2% that drives you up the wall. Uh, so it's, it's a twofold accusation. And so on the one hand, we need to see ourselves through his lens. We need to see that he's taken our iniquity away. Right? That's what he says to the high priest, to Joshua. He says, see, behold, I've removed your iniquity, and I've put on you rich robes, pure vestments. He put on us a robe of righteousness. And so, yeah, we fail. We make mistakes. But then we repent of it. We say, Lord, how do you see me? Okay, you haven't quit, right? You, you chose me. You're not giving up on me, right? So I'm going to push delete, and I'm going to move forward. And I'm going to see myself through that storyline. But then it's how we deal with one another as well. It's that twofold accusation. So really what Zechariah 3 and 4 gives us is it, it kind of answers a question. <laughs> how, how does a weak, broken and at times sinful people, how do we participate in these incredible promises and these uh, seemingly impossible assignments? How, how do we participate? Because in the natural, when we hear the voice of accusation, we feel disqualified and we want to quit. And then we look at our brothers and sisters and we want to disqualify them. Say, well, they're not qualified. They, they can't do that. They can't say that. Like, they, they hurt me last week. Or, or maybe, I mean, this is the state for many believers. They hurt me 10 years ago, and I still haven't let it go because I'm looking at them through that lens of accusation. So what, what do we do? We ask the Father. We come to the Lord, and we pray this prayer. Father, let me see, let me see myself the way that you see me. Let me feel what you feel about me. And let me see my brothers and sisters the way that you see them, the way that you feel about them. And it's probably going to be different <laughs> than how we feel a lot of the time. So again, it's twofold accusation to get us to accuse one another and to get us to accuse ourselves. So on the one hand, we need to understand no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, right? I have the robes of righteousness. He's removed my iniquity. Uh, he... My weaknesses, my deficiencies, and my failures will not get the last word, right? He's already baked all this into the cake, into the equation. Like, he knows where I'm at. He remembers our frame. He knows we're but dust, right? And he's like, I've got a plan by my spirit to take you on a process. We're going to overcome a lot of those things, and I'm going to take you through to the other side. 
So he said, I've already got this worked out. Just don't quit. Stick with it. Keep seeing yourself the way that I see you. But then it's also 1 Peter 4, 8. It's above all things, having love for one another that covers a multitude of sins. It's covering over it one another in our weaknesses and our deficiencies. It's not wanting to quit on each other when somebody has a weakness that is off-putting to me or they say something or do something that hurts me and wounds me and it feels like a betrayal, but will I, in that moment, shut the, shut the love faucet off and uh, point accusation back at them or will I keep that, Lord, how do you see them? And keep the love flowing, right? So there's two narratives, two storylines. We can see ourselves through the God narrative or we can see ourselves through the accusation narrative, right? The lens of our deficiencies and failures. And so Zechariah 4 shows how God anoints Joshua and Zerubbabel to do the work, but they can't do the work without taking care of the accusation. And almost any time you look at this, when God's people are doing a work and an assignment from the Lord, whether it's building the temple or Nehemiah building the wall, what almost always comes is opposition, but it's opposition that's usually in the form of accusation. They're doing this. And anytime God's people start to move and begin to partner with him to release his kingdom, his government in the earth, there's usually somebody, and it's often somebody, it's a brother, a sister in the body of Christ to say, you're trying to do this. What, what happens when David's there? Like, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? And his brother's like, I know you came here just to watch the battle. And David's like, what? <laughs> like, you're my bro, man. <laughs> so that voice of accusation will come in. And are we going to get distracted by that and hung up on that? Or are we going to continue to see that person through God's narrative and keep doing our assignment? Right? So the Lord is moving us into this John 17 unity, even in the midst of a rising tide and a culture of betrayal in the earth and in the body of Christ. I mean, just had anybody before five years ago heard of the cancel culture? Anything that anybody says or does, it doesn't matter whether it was 10, 15 years ago. There's accusations. You said this 15 years ago, even though back then we were all saying that, but it, you, we have evidence of you saying it here on Facebook or Twitter, and like now we're going to accuse you and we're going to cancel you. Nobody listen to this person. And just accusations everywhere. And now you see just rising tides here in a, uh, a, an election year and, and just the, the political conflict, and we've got uh, ethnic tension going on and just there's accusations flying left and right and the Lord says I have another narrative I have another story that I want my people to live on and it's not this accusation narrative even if it's true there's so much more again that might just be one two three percent of the stories like I've got a whole storyline and a narrative and I'm seeing them through a different lens so how, how do we do this how, what, what's the path, you know, is it just we're just going to pray it and hope it comes to pass and just, you know, maybe if we just think about it hard enough, he's just going to bring us through. It's like, okay, that's good. We should trust him. But Jesus actually gave us some really practical handles uh, for how to defeat accusation uh, in our lives and in the lives of others. So Matthew chapter 5, turn there if you would, Sermon on the Mount. So it's just kingdom living. We're going to key in on verses 44 and 45. So I'll give you a minute to get there. Is anyone else like on fire right now? I feel like a whole burnt offering. Uh, <laughs> we could maybe... Uh, could probably just turn it off or something at this point. <laughs> ah. Thank you, Father. So he says here in Matthew 5, uh, verses 44 through 45, and, and this, is, um, this is New King James, which is probably going to be different than a lot of your translations, um, but I'm going to read it in, in this one, and uh, 
we'll, we'll talk about it from there. So he says, let me see actually here if I can back up to get a little more context. Yeah, I'm going to start in verse 43. So he says, you have heard it said, or that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So what's the way to this supernatural unity? How do we overcome this accusation storyline or accusation narrative that wants to operate in our lives and wants to flow through us and operate around us? Well, it looks like when, when people fail us, when they hurt us, when they betray us, we, we love, we, we bless people who curse us, those who don't give us honor, those who wound us. So we bless them with our words. We do good to them with our deeds, right? People who hate us, who treat us badly. And we pray for people who use us and persecute us. Now, if you've got a different translation than King James or New King James, you might say, hey, mine only says... Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So I, I get to get out of the blessing and the doing good part, right? Uh, unfortunately, Luke, uh, in a parallel, does not give you that option. So here's Luke chapter 6. In your translation, or what I don't know what you have, but he says, But I say to you, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who abuse you. It's the same same command. So we, we love them, but then it expressed, this is what loving them looks like. <laughs> you do good to them. Do, do nice things for them, even though they mistreated you. You bless them with their words. You refuse to be a voice for accusation. Now, that doesn't mean we, we lie and say things about them that aren't true, like, oh, they're just the most amazing person, and they do all these things, and that's not true. It's like, in, in, in as much as it is true and you are able to, you bless them with your words. And you refuse to speak about them through that lens uh, and, and give voice to that accusation, right? You cover them in their weaknesses. Now, what am I, I'm not talking about if someone is perpetrating and like literally abusing someone else. I'm not saying like we don't expose that. Like if somebody's hurting someone physically, emotionally, sexually, we uncover that, right? We expose that because we're protecting the victims, right? But somebody in their weakness who's failed and they've wounded you and hurt you, you don't then go tell four or five people about that. You bless them. You do good to them. You refuse to see them through the eyes of accusation. Pray for them. And, and this is what, pray, you know, oftentimes we, like, we, we go to our prayer closet and we say, Lord, I just lift this person up before you. I just pray that you would just show them how wrong they are. <laughs> Let your fire come. I mean, no, Lord. I mean, <laughs> We love it when the Lord's merciful to us, right? But you know he loves to be merciful to them too. <laughs> That's what he just said. He said, the Lord shows mercy. He makes his sun rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. I love Luke, Luke goes on here. This is, again, Luke chapter 6. He says, uh, if you do this, if you love your enemies, if you bless those who, who curse you, you will be sons of the Most High. Just like uh, Matthew said, you'll be sons of your heavenly Father. And then he says, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. And then it goes on and says, be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. So, so how's this work? Somebody wounds us and hurts us. Something about somebody really rakes us and bother us, bothers us. And what, what instinct is we, we want to hurt them back, 
And, and maybe not in a direct way, you know, maybe we want to be kind of passive aggressive about it. <laughs> like, just kind of sow some seeds of like uh, doubt about this person. I don't know about them, you know, I'd stay away from them and like start just speaking from that accusation narrative to other people. And, uh, you know, in the charismatic world, you know, I, this is one that really rakes me. It's like, well, I don't know, that person, they're a Jezebel. It's like, oh, we just totally took that and we weaponized it, right? <laughs> like, now I've got a loaded gun that I can point at anybody who really bothers me. And I'm not saying that people don't operate in Jezebel, but before I'd ever be pointing a finger at anybody, I'd be like, have I ever operated in a Jezebel type of spirit? Tried to control, tried to manipulate. It's like... Okay, first person I need to look at is me. Before I, I, I never want to call someone Jezebel because whether they're operating in a spirit or not, that's not who they are. That's not their identity. That's not the narrative that God sees them through. Yeah, I've probably operated in that spirit, you know? So I need to be like, Lord, you're so merciful to me. Lord, have mercy on them. Reveal your love to them, your kindness to them. And then his best as much as we're able, we need to speak blessing, speak life. And what this does is it takes us on a process. He says, when you do this, you will be like your heavenly father. You'll be sons of your father. What does that mean? I'm already a son of the father, right? You will go on a journey of transformation where you will begin to see people and relate to people the way that the father sees them and the way that the Father relates to them. It's not first nature for most of us. Again, somebody does bad to me, my instinct is to do bad to them, or at least avoid them like the plague, right? <laughs> and God's like, no, 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 no. I'm merciful to people who are ungrateful, who are unkind, and who are unjust, who don't deserve it. So when you pray for them, don't say, Lord, give them what they deserve. And he's like, well... If I give them what they deserve, I have to give you what you deserve <laughs> because I don't change and I'm not partial. <laughs> and you are judging them through their actions and how they hurt you, but you judge yourself by your intentions. You, ever, you notice that? We always, everybody's got good intentions, but we still lash out and we do things, we say things that are just not right, not true, that are hurtful. And the Lord's like, if I judge them, I got to judge you too. You really, you really don't want judgment. You really want mercy. <laughs> because I got to treat you the same way I treat them. And the Lord is merciful. He's long suffering. I think of uh, Exodus 34, where God reveals his name and his nature to Moses. And, you know, that the, whenever you read this verse, the elephant in the room is always the. Uh, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He visits the iniquity of the fathers to, uh, on the sons to the third and fourth generation. And it's like you could read the whole thing like this beautiful. He's gracious and compassionate. It's like, oh, this is so wonderful, Lord. And then we get to that part, and he's like, he punishes the children <laughs> for their sins. <laughs> and it's like that gets blown out of proportion in our minds because that's maybe how we're used to being treated. Like you make one mistake and Somebody's there with the hammer to hit you right over the head with it. And the Lord's like, no, well, hang on a second. Read the whole thing. Like the whole revelation is freighted. It's, it's weighted on the side of mercy. It says he shows loving kindness. He shows steadfast love to thousands. And he shows justice to the third and fourth. <laughs> right? So what, what weight is the, th the whole thing is weighted towards mercy. This is how God operates. Jesus said it. He's kind and he's merciful to people who are really just nasty. And so he says, when you do that, what it's going to do is it's going to take you through a process that's actually going to expose your own weaknesses. Because, again, our instincts are not to bless. Our instincts are not to do good. And that exposes our weakness, and it brings us into this loving relationship with the Father where he gets to allow us to see them from his perspective. There's a gift that your enemies can give you. And again, when I say your enemies, I'm not talking about like George Soros or like that guy way off there that you're never going to meet, and he's doing all these nasty things. It's like, 
well, I guess I can forgive him, you know? <laughs> it's like, no, it's people in your life that betray you, that hurt you, no matter how small or how big. And I know many of you have probably gone through some serious hurt, serious betrayal. We've all gone through it at, at, at different levels, in different ways. I don't want to measure one against the other. It's like, I, I've experienced that, where people say nasty things to you. People are not nice to you, and you don't know why. People kind of overlook you and pass over you. I've experienced those things. But the Father's, the, the path that he's got us on, uh, loving our enemies, there's nothing for it. There's a gift that your enemies can give you that no friend could ever give you. Your enemies will say things about you that your best friends would never say about you. Might give you some insight. <laughs> it's like, you know, Lord, I, I've never seen that before, and I certainly don't want to just take it because I know there's exaggeration and, you know, the enemy loves to accuse, but Holy Spirit, is there any truth to that? And he might be like, nope, you throw that away. Or he's like, well, they, you know, you don't see this, but there is this thing that you do often. <laughs> it's like, oh, I didn't see that. He's like, that's okay. I knew that was there. You didn't know it was there. It took an enemy to expose it. <laughs> It's like, okay, let's deal with it. It's like not to get under condemnation. It's like, okay, you know, push, push delete, and let's, let's deal with it. And you know what's great is like our enemies, they get our best prayer time. <laughs> because when somebody really rakes you, you know, your mind wants to keep dwelling on it and say, if the next time I see them, or maybe I'll try never to see them, like depending on your uh, personality types, you know, it's like, but the next time I see them, I'm going to say this to them, and then they're going to say this, and then I'm going to say that, and you just, uh, we all do this, like, you rehearse the conversation and how it's going to go, and the Lord's like, no, 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 I want you to see them from my lens, I want you to bless them, I want you to pray for them, and then it's, then it's the whole, <laughs> okay, Lord, I pray that you'd Bless them, bless their finances. Like, I mean, I want them to have enough, like not too much, but like, you know, just all the things in our heart. And like, it's this process of like, okay, Lord, how do you see them? I want to see them from your perspective. And it's just, what it does is it breaks all that accusation off. And we begin to become transformed to be like our Heavenly Father, who's merciful to the just and to the unjust. So Matthew 5 it's it's the it's the um, it's the potter's wheel <laughs> that gets us to John 17. Does that make sense? We refuse to see ourselves or to see others through the accusation narrative. We choose to see them through the Father's story, and we allow Him to take us on a process. So Psalm 18, verse 35. This is a. Uh, Kind of a verse you could easily pass over. Psalm 18 is this incredible prayer of God's deliverance in the life of David. He says, you, you, you snatched me up. You, you, you sent your arrows. You, you, you delivered me. You protected me. You delight in me, Lord. And then he says this in verse, 30, verse 35. He says, um, let me just read the whole thing here. He says, you've given me the shield of your salvation, and your right hand supported me, and your gentleness made me great. The Lord's gentleness, David said, his gentleness has made me great. And so here's the thing. It's twofold. Just, just like the twofold accusation, God's gentleness in our lives is, is twofold. It's his gentleness in how he deals with us, even in our weakness, Right? The, the, look at the way that the Lord dealt with David. He dealt with him in gentleness. Things that David did, and I know he was tapping into some revelation there too, but like things that David did, other kings tried to do it, it did not go well. <laughs> David's like, bring me the ephod and like doing all this priestly stuff. You remember what happened when Uzziah went in the temple and tried to burn incense? The guy got covered in leprosy <laughs> for the rest of his life. And the, the way the Lord dealt with David, and David was an amazing man, but he had some serious deficiencies. He had some lack in his life. But that wasn't the narrative or the story that God was looking at him through. In fact, I love this passage um, in uh, Acts. I'm trying to remember. I think it's Paul who said, he says, David, after he had um, fulfilled 
God's purpose in his generation. He, he died and slept with his fathers. He was buried. David fulfilled the purpose of God in his generation. And you're like, man, David made some huge mistakes. Like he committed adultery. He had the husband killed. He lied about it. Like that's like Ten Commandments stuff right there. <laughs> like, and God's like, yeah, but I'm not looking at him through his weaknesses and through his moments of failure. I'm looking at him from my perspective, through my lens of mercy and grace and through the big picture storyline. And from my perspective, he fulfilled the purposes that I had for him in his generation. So that gives me hope, even in my, and that, this, again, that doesn't mean I make excuses for my deficiencies and my failures. It doesn't mean I make excuses for yours and just say, oh, you, you're okay. You know. No, we need to call one another up and speak the truth in love. But it means we refuse to be a voice of accusation. So God was gentle in the way that he dealt with David. But as a result of that, what does the scripture say? Freely you've received. Now what do you got to do? <laughs> you got to give it too. Like we love it when God's merciful to us. I really like it when he's kind and he's merciful to me. But when he's kind to, like, my enemies, <laughs> it's kind of like, what? What? I don't get it. Like, they're the enemy. <laughs> like, you remember the story of Jonah. Like, that whole story is about the scandal of, like, what do you do with a God who loves your enemy? We want to make it about the fish, and it's not about the fish. I mean, like, the fish was the vehicle God used to actually get him on the right track. But the, the gut punch, the sucker punch to your gut, is in chapter 4, when God has mercy on Nineveh, the oppressive army, the oppressive people of Jonah's day, like, these are the Assyrians, man. They, like, killed our people, raped our women, sacked our villages. Like, they, like, just skin people alive and bury them in the sand for fun. Like, these are not nice people. Like, if anybody doesn't deserve mercy, it's these guys. <laughs> And so Jonah does everything he can to not give them the message. <laughs> and he says the reason for it in chapter 4. It's the, it's the very end of, of Jonah. He says, I knew that you were a merciful God <laughs> who loves to give grace to people and who's slow to anger. Like, I knew somehow if you could find a way, Lord, you would give these dirty, rotten scoundrels mercy. And I did not want them to get mercy. <laughs> And that's honestly how we feel sometimes about our enemies. If we're honest, it's the scandal of like, there's a God in heaven who's ravished over you, and he's just as ravished over your enemy. The same way he feels about you, he feels that way about your enemies, people that wounded you deeply. So your gentleness has made me great. So David experience God's gentleness in his life, but then he had to give it away. And you see this manifest in David's life in so many ways. You got Saul, his father-in-law, is chasing him down for years, trying to kill him, heaving up, heaping up accusations against him, sending in people after him. David's on the run for his life. And two separate times, God, God did this. God delivered Saul into David's hand, and it was a test. This could all be over. Just, whoosh, it's done. All the accusation, the running for your life, you'll become king. Like, this is the fast track to your destiny, man. This person, they are an, uh, there's an obstacle on the road to your destiny, right? And isn't that how we look at people sometimes? They're like, obstacles like you're in the way and it's like the Lord's like actually I'm using them in ways that you can't see and if you walk this out with me they will actually through the difficulty and the irritation of you learning how to bless them that is actually what's going to propel you into your destiny and you don't even know it because here's the deal if we try to vindicate ourselves and deliver ourselves God can't do it for us and if you do it you're going to have to do it again and again and again and again. But when God vindicates you, story's over. 
I mean, your story's not over. <laughs> like, it's a done deal, right? So when we go through that process, yes, we're putting ourselves and we're committing ourselves to him as we bless our enemies, as we f- refuse to participate in accusation. Number one, we're standing in support with one another. It's like, okay, that happened, but I'm going to cover them. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to bless them. I'm going to support them. Because at the end of the day, you're going to be together in the kingdom forever. Like, you're going to continue to be friends forever. And, like, right now, it might be kind of adversarial and not real fun. But if you do the work of blessing them, what, what does it say? When you do that, when you bless people, it's like heaping hot coals on their head. And I used to be like, well, that doesn't seem very nice. <laughs> Like, how's that work? And I I heard all kinds of different explanations. The one that really stuck with me, and I don't know if anybody told me this, but it just kind of struck me. It's like, well, what does a coal do? Like, it kind of marks you. It kind of brands you, right? And if coals hit your head, it's like your your mind, like just something gets etched into your mind. Like, man, I was really not kind to that person. And all they did was bless me. Like, what do they know that I don't know? And, like, it kind of, like, begins to bug you. <laughs> like, and it kind of haunts you. It's like, man, there's something to that. And it begins this process of if, they, if they're willing to go with it, them turning back, you know, back to the Lord or, or maybe reconciliation. The goal is always reconciliation. But even if that isn't possible, we bless them. And when we do that, we know that God will eventually vindicate us. And we think it's going to happen in a week or a month, think years. <laughs> because the, here's the thing, we don't realize it, but we have need of the journey. Because there's, again, in each one of us, weaknesses and deficiencies, and your enemies, they expose it. And then God begins to take you on a process. of Like, we're going to deal with those one at a time, and you're going to learn to see and respond and relate to people the way that I do. We, we need this journey. We need it. Again, there's a gift that your enemy can give you that nobody else can give you. So David was gentle with Saul. Twice God delivered him into his hand, and he could have just taken care of it right now there, but he refused to deliver himself. He refused to vindicate. He refused to even speak evil about the guy. You remember when Saul finally did die? David writes this lament and sings like, oh, how the mighty have fallen and like speaks these words of honor. And even the the guy that finished Saul off, like he thought like he was going to get like, man, David's going to be so like thrilled. Like, I mean, I don't know, maybe he'll make me a second in command or something like that. And David's like, you touched the Lord's anointed. (laughs) He wasn't too gentle with that guy. (laughs) They killed him. (laughs) Uh, But Saul, twice David could have delivered himself. He refused to do it. And there are times when somebody who hurts you, you'll have dirt on them. You'll have something about them that you could say, you could expose them, you could tell everybody about it, and it would totally, in, in the natural, it would seem like it would vindicate you, right? Even just some of the subtle things we say sometimes. And love covering a multitude of sins say, nope, I will, I refuse to be a voice of accusation and speak evil about them because I'm on a journey to become like my heavenly father, to be sons of the father. We need this journey to be transformed, to be like God. So let's, uh, if we could get some music think we'll kind of bring it to a close here. That's enough, I think, for now. We're going to pick back up in this next week, um, kind of in a similar theme of just how we see ourselves, how we see one another, refusing uh, the accusation narrative. And again, Revelation 12, it's how, how do we overcome the accuser? Well, it's by the blood of the lamb, right? And the word of our testimony. So there's a part that God does right? He covers us in his blood and his grace and his mercy, and he sees us through that, through his storyline, 
but it's also the word of our testimony, right? And I've often heard people say, well, that's just when you share a testimony. I, I just have this sense it's bigger than that. What is the testimony that comes out of our mouth? Could part of it be God's words in our mouth? Seeing one another from God's perspective? Overcoming, conquering the accuser of the brethren? means I refuse to become an accuser of the brethren. And I'm going to say, Lord, help me see me how you see me. And help me see my brothers and sisters, even those who've hurt me deeply. Let me see them how you see them. Here's the thing. If, if this is where God is taking things, we want to start doing this now. And I know many of you have already been walking this out. So if that's what you've been doing, keep going. Keep going on the process. Because here's the deal. With where things are headed, Jesus said, on the one hand, you got Matthew 24, betrayal and accusation rampant across the earth, even happening within the body of Christ. But on the other hand, you've got this John 17, perfect unity. So which storyline do you want to be a part of? And number two, if you want to partner with me in my storyline, you cannot impart this. You can't impart the Matthew 5, you know, well, you just got to bless and do good and, and pray for them and love them. You can't impart it if you don't embrace it. Right? You can't give what you don't have. Right? And this isn't something we get on the fly. I feel like what I just did right now is like, I feel like I'm a waiter and I just opened up a menu and I read you the menu. And you're like, yeah, that's good. That's good. Well, the feeding part <laughs> is when you go take this to prayer, you meditate on it, and the Lord's going to highlight people. Maybe He's probably already highlighted a bunch of people for you, and you start doing it. That's the, that's the eating part, right? Like this wasn't, like maybe, maybe this fed you a little bit, but the real eating comes when I take this. It's like, okay, Zechariah chapter 3. I'm going to meditate on it. Oh, okay. Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 9. You're ravished. Your heart is ravished over me. You love me radically. And he's like, yeah, and I love him too. I love her too. It's like, okay. All right, Lord, help me to see them the way that you see them. And I bless them. I pray for them. Give them mercy, Lord, just like you gave me. I've received it, and now I'm going to give it away. And that transforms us to be like our Heavenly Father. This isn't, this isn't optional. God requires this of us, right? Because it's the way that He relates to us. So again, there's nothing for it. Like, if we haven't been doing this, like, that's not, don't get under guilt and condemnation. The Lord doesn't want that. It's like, I'm serious about this, and I want to take you on the journey to become more and more like your Heavenly Father, to see people the way that I see them, to deal with them, to relate with them the way that I relate with them. Because God is a God of justice, but He is also a God of mercy. And we, we want to pray and plead on the side of mercy for our brothers. We don't want to have that thing in our heart that rejoices when somebody else is going through it. <laughs> That's not the Lord's heart. He <laughs> says he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. His heart is, is weeping and broken every time somebody turns away from him. When somebody who doesn't know him and says, I want nothing to do, when they pass on, his heart is broken. We want to be people of mercy in the way that we deal with one another. And I think of the, this is just one more thing here, just, I just want to bring it to a point of just to respond to the Lord, and maybe the Lord would have you respond right where you're at, maybe he's putting some finger, his finger on a few things, if you want to stay where you're at, that's fine, if you want to come and just spend some time down in the altar here, if you want special prayer, I'd love to pray with you. But to, 
to overcome the accuser, to overcome that, that storyline, that narrative, to number one, see ourselves the way that God sees us, and number two, begin to see our brothers and sisters through that same light. Just really quickly, I think of this story with Peter, where it's, it's the Passover meal right before Jesus is betrayed and crucified, and in Luke 22, he says, hey, Simon, Satan has asked, he's demanded to sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you. And then he says, and when you return, which implies you're going to fall tonight, come and strengthen your brothers after you've returned. And Peter's like, what are you talking about? And, and Jesus tells him, and this is in several places, but in John chapter 13, he says, you're, you're going to deny me three times. He's like, Lord, I would never deny you. I'm ready to die for you. Like, you told us to take two swords. I'm thinking, like, this is going to be the most epic battle ever fought. <laughs> like, we only need two swords to, like, beat the enemy. Like, we're going to kick the Romans' butt. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. no. You're going to deny me three times. He's like, Lord, I would never do that. And then you read on, and I'm going to just key in on John here. You can see this in John chapter 18. Peter kind of follows behind as they're taking Jesus uh, before the Sanhedrin to, to accuse him. And he's kind of hanging out, and it says he's warming himself by this, um, this fire of coals, which has, that detail is important. He's warming himself there, and three separate times, like one time it's a servant girl, uh, another time, it's another guy there, and they're all saying, hey, you, we recognize you. you. You were with him. Yeah, you're one of them. I, I could tell by your accent. I saw you in the garden. He's like, no, no, it wasn't me. And, you know, he denies Jesus three times. And then, you know, you know the story. The rooster crows and goes out weeping. And then even after Jesus is resurrected and he appears before them and he shows himself, I imagine Peter's still walking in this accusation. He's like, oh, I, I thought I thought I was going to be the guy. I thought I was going to be the guy that that did the big thing like I got the sword out. I was going to I was going for the head. I, I missed. I hit the ear. <laughs> and uh, then Jesus rebuked me and then, and then I denied him three times. Like I thought I could be the guy that like really does it. That, that really follows Jesus wholeheartedly that when everybody else falls away, like I wouldn't fall away. I was going to be the, the committed, radical disciple, and I thought I was, but I'm not. And he's just, even after the resurrection, under this weight of condemnation, like, man, I failed him. And it was true. Like, he really did fail him, and that's when the enemy comes in, like, well, yeah, you really did fail him. You're just a failure, and, you know, just, we can rehearse that, and the enemy just loves to take us down many roads and, and so I imagine Peter's under that. And then you read it, John, it says, Peter says, I'm going fishing. And I, I think in Peter's mind, it's like, you know what? I'm good at fishing. I'm just going to go back to what I know. Like, surely, like, I know he's back from the dead and, like, his kingdom's still, it's, it's here, it's coming. Like, but, you know, the other guys, they, they can do that. I just, I can't. I'm I've failed him too many times, and surely he's got to be thinking like, yeah, Peter is, he's out, you know, we can't trust that guy. And so he goes fishing, and, and Jesus encounters him, and very similar to when he first called him, he has him cast their net on the other side, and they catch all these fish, and they're like, it's the Lord, and he goes, he has, says he, he jumps out of the boat, swims to Jesus, and uh, he gets to the shore, and it says Jesus was there cooking some fish on a fire of coals. You remember the last time we saw the fire of coals? Peter was there warming himself, and he denied Jesus three times. And if you look in John's gospel there, that's the only two times you see that phrase. And so I imagine Peter's standing there, and he's brought right back to that moment, like, oh, the, the failure, the denial. And Jesus asked him three times, like, hey, Pete, you love me? He's like, yeah, Lord, you know I love you. And he says, feed my sheep. He does this three times, and each time he says, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. He's like, Pete, like, you're still my guy. <laughs> like, 
the, the program, like nothing's changed. Like I knew that was in you. I, that's why I told you. I told you it was there. You remember when Jesus said to the disciples, like, you didn't choose me. I chose you. I knew all of the deficiencies, all the failures. I knew it, and I still chose you. And your weakness and your failure is not going to keep you from me. Only you can let that happen. And it's not going to keep you from fulfilling the, the assignment that I have for you. Like, Pete, feed my sheep. Do, do the work, man. Like, the calling for you has not changed. It's the same. You're going back fishing. I'm telling you, you're still my man. Feed my sheep. And so he does that three times. And just for every denial, every real betrayal. I mean, these are people that followed Jesus for years sat at his feet and they shared life together so the betrayal was very real and Jesus said no I I don't see you through that lens I don't see you through that storyline of accusation I see you through my grace through my mercy and I see what I've called you to be I see the big picture I see it all he sees the end from the beginning so let's just respond to the Lord and for many of us, it's, it's how we see ourselves. And Lord, just we ask you, just reveal to us how you see us. And for others, it's how we see those around us. And probably for most of us, it's a mixture of both. So Lord, the way that you see us, let us see one another through that lens. We want to be seen as sons of our Father, who shows mercy to the ungrateful, to the unrighteous, who's kind to the just and to the unjust. We want to be seen as sons of God Most High. You told us to be mature, be perfect, be complete in the same way that you are. This is, we need this journey of you transforming us to respond like you, to see one another, to see ourselves the way that you see us. You're ravished over us. Your heart is moved. You say your delight is in us. You sing over us. You dance over us, even with shouts and songs of deliverance. So, Father, we just ask you by your Spirit, pour the love of the Father into our hearts. Reveal to us the way that you see us and reveal to us the way that you see those around us, especially those that have wounded us. Help us, Father, to bless. Help us to love, to pray, to do good, even for those who spitefully use us and abuse us, Father. In Jesus' name, Lord, let us manifest your name, your nature, the fragrance of who you are in the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you want to hang out uh, and just continue to respond to the Lord, if you want to come to the altar and do it that way, um, I encourage you to do that. If you have to go, be blessed as you go. And uh, we love you. And uh, we'll see everybody back next week or Wednesday. So blessings, everybody. And if anybody wants special prayer, I'd love to pray with you. Amen.